So I started this project a little while ago now, and as I wanted to deviate a little bit from some of the methods in the build notes, I did what I always do. I headed on over to YouTube to see how some other people had done things. And, and as it turns out, I couldn't find a great deal. Stefan Gotteswinter has a, a few videos that show some machining operations on his shaper. And I did find a very detailed overview of a finished project on a, on a clock making channel called Cosmos. I'll link both of those down below. But aside from that, I couldn't find much at all. So I thought I'd be the fool to commit my attempt to video. And, and this is that. And there's a couple of points worth getting out of the way at the start. Number one, I am not a videographer, so the audio, lighting and editing are awful. I apologise for this ahead of time. Uh, any comments or tips on this are gratefully received. And secondly, and probably most importantly, I am not a professional engineer. Anything you see me doing in these videos is not an endorsement. I am not trying to teach anyone how to do things. This is simply a log of my build. Again, comments or criticism on the things that you see in the videos more than appreciated in the comments. With the intro out of the way, the first part to look at is the main casting. Uh, it looks pretty good, and initially it needs the base squaring up, decking off flat, and bringing into dimension. Uh, you will notice I have painted this ahead of time. In my head I thought this would be a great idea, and make sure all the machined faces are nice and clean, and the paint will be right up to the edges and it will look lovely. But um, on reflection, I think the setups this is going to go through is going to make a terrible mess. I guess we'll find out, won't we? The dimensions are all on the plans, and the spindle housing length is to be the same as the base, so both the surfaces can be machined together. So the first operation is to flatten one side, which will then become the reference face for all the other operations. Uh, as luck would have it, with the casting sitting on its side, the cast spindle housing sits reasonably square in both axes straight out of the mould, so I'm simply going to bolt this to the mill table as it is, and flatten off one side. Um, I've chosen this orientation deliberately, as the spindle boss here is to be machined to take a mounting bracket, and by taking just enough off this side to clean up the surface, and then removing material from the other side to bring it into dimension, that guarantees having enough material to accommodate that bracket. I'm taking about 20 thou in two stages off this side, with the final pass having quite a small step over, as you can see. My little milling machine is not in tram and never has been, not from the factory. So this small step over, combined with the relatively small diameter cutter, minimises the rippling effect that this adjustment error causes. Now if I'd used a fly cutter or a face mill here, I'd end up with a really clean but measurably curved surface. Now I could tram this mill, but there is no built-in adjustment, so you're left with the prospect of adding shims between the column and the base, and honestly, adding anything at all reduces the rigidity in what is an already really flimsy machine. And for most of the work that I do, this method usually results in an acceptably flat surface. I think the finish is all okay on this, so I'm going to go ahead and attach this to an angle plate to machine the second surface which is the bottom of the casting. Um, it will be at 90 degrees to the side I've just finished, and I'm going to use a single piece of threaded bar to secure it to the angle plate. Obviously, this isn't the most secure of setups, but I think for the depth of cut I'm going to be taking, in my experience, it's going to be okay. Uh, I'll position this on the angle plate such that the cleanup cut will leave the base at a roughly equal thickness across its length. And it's not critical to do so. It's these two faces that are going to form the references for everything else. But for aesthetic reasons, I want to get this quite close so it looks nice um, when it's finished. We are set up with the casting bolted to the plate and the plate to the mill. Due to the lack of support on this casting, I will be taking shallow cuts and again for the final pass, a small step over to mitigate that tram issue. I am not too worried about the dimensions at the moment. Once I have these two faces and I can trust them, I will need to take some measurements to arrive at my final dimensions. Yes, this will mean repeating this setup, which is poor practice in terms of workflow. But as this is a one-off part, and it's for me, I am more interested in getting this close than saving a few minutes on setup time. Again, we are back at the bench and the part looks okay, um, but it's time for a little inspection to make sure we are not miles away from where we need to be. I'm going to check first that our two surfaces are at 90 degrees, and I'll do this with an indicator and a reference square. Uh, this is one that I've made, and despite appearances, it is probably the squarest thing in my workshop. 
with the indicator set, it is time for the moment of truth. And this is only a half hour indicator, but for all intents and purposes, with the machinery and measuring equipment I have in this workshop, that is square, which is a, a huge relief. So Thomas designed this with the Myford 7 series lathes in mind, with the dividing head spindle bore being exactly on the lathe centre height when the dividing head is mounted on the lathe cross slide. This is guaranteed to be the case as the spindle bore in the casting will be machined using a between centres boring bar on the lathe itself. All of this is fine, but unless we pay attention to the overall height of this casting, that bore could and probably would end up off centre to the cylindrical portion of the casting. Now this wouldn't affect the operation of the dividing head, but it would look terrible. So with a bit of maths, I have determined that for my lathe and this casting, I will need to remove 58 thousandths from the bottom of the base. I will scribe that using a height gauge, but the line is for visual reference only. I find it really helps when fixturing the part uh, and helps me ensure I have clearance from the angle plate or, or whatever else I'm using. I will use the graduations on the mill to actually dial in that 58 thou. So with that done, it is back to the mill in the same setup as before to go and remove the material. Here we are with the same setup as before, and I just need to dial this in to return the part to its previous orientation. The indicator here is marked in thousandths, and the fluctuation you can see is due to that tram error I was talking about earlier. It looks to be in the order of three tenths or so for each pass of the cutter. For what this is for, that's more than acceptable to me. So with the part locked down, I'll give it one more check. I'm satisfied with that, so I can go ahead and remove the rest of the material from this base. The remaining material was removed in three passes. Uh, this one is the final pass, and it looks pretty good. I now need to bring this to final dimension, which is going to require the machining of the other side and both of the short edges. The side is straightforward and it will be clamped to the mill table as before. And then for the edges, I will do the first one on the angle plate because I can dial it in square. And then the final one I will do upright against the angle plate so that I can use the mill table as a reference at the bottom to ensure parallelism. So over to the mill and let's get those three things done. The width was brought in in four passes, with progress being checked using a depth mic and gauge block before eventually dialing in the last pass. One final check of dimension completes the width and the casting can be removed from this setup. Having dialed in the angle plate square to the mill and reattaching the casting for almost the last time, a start can be made on the short edges. Now because a number of the features on this part are referenced to these short edges, it is important that the material we remove from them results in the round feature that takes the spindle bore being centered on the long edge. This is again a visual alignment and the features will be machined in the correct position regardless, but we also want them to look aligned with the shape of the casting. Due to the lack of rigidity in both my machine and the setup, small cuts are taken with a roughing end mill to get close to size and then the final cuts are taken with a sharp four flute cutter with the final pass being a very light climb cut. The final setup to dimension the base has the casting clamped vertically against the angle plate. I've done it this way so that I can be sure that both of those short edges will be parallel to each other and it also allows me access to the cast boss which will need to be flattened and then drilled to take a split cotter type spindle lock. Taking the edge down to dimension is straightforward with the size measured again using a depth mic and gauge block to the mill table. With this done, the offset to the boss can be dialed in and the surfacing cuts made to bring this into sight. Now I'm edge finding the base here as the position of the hole in the boss is reasonably critical. It has to intersect the spindle bore by a prescribed amount. 
too little and the spindle lock may be ineffective and too much and there is a risk that the cotter may jam and therefore not release smoothly. Now while this position is critical, the horizontal is purely cosmetic and so the center of the boss has been laid out on the surface plate and the center drill is aligned on this axis by eye alone. The bore here is to be half inch in diameter, so after center drilling I'm setting the depth by touching off with the pilot drill and then adjusting the depth stop on the mill using a caliper. I've also added a feeler gauge of the appropriate size underneath just to give some support. The pilot hole is quarter inch, um, that's enlarged to 31 64ths before finally reaming out to half an inch. Now the base is square, it is possible to move this into the vise for the remaining operations. It is then a trivial task to add the remaining features by edge finding front and side and then simply following the dimensions on the plans, either using the hand wheel graduations or a DRO. Firstly, the flat surface is decked off to height before switching to a ball nosed end mill at the end just to transition the cut into the round section of the casting net. This section calls for three holes. These are centre drilled with the outside ones enlarged and reamed to 3 8 and the centre one is drilled and tapped M6. The only purpose of this tapped hole is to allow us to clamp the cotters in place so that they can be machined with the bore for the tailstock bar. This should become clearer when we get to that operation. Next up are two holes drilled and tapped M5 in the top of the housing. Again, I am simply working to the dimensions on the plans here and these are there to allow occasional oiling of the main spindle and will usually be capped off with grub screws. Yet again, we are back to the bench to mark out for the next features to be added to the casting, which are the mounting holes and their spot faces. And just like the other dimensions on this, they are spaced to suit the Myford lathe, uh, specifically the T-slots on it. If you don't have a Myford or intend to use the dividing head exclusively on a mill, then of course these dimensions can be adjusted. As I do have a Myford lathe, I am going to stick with the plans. Now a little bit of care is necessary here as the holes are not centered on the short edge, but are offset slightly towards the front of the spindle. As before, the dimensions from the plans will be dialed in on the mill and so the layout is there as a visual check only that I'm not about to do something silly once I have this set up. Access to these hole positions is of course from the bottom, so here we are yet again dialed in on the angle plate. After edge finding, it is then a trivial task to dial in those hole positions using the DRO. Finally for today is to add those spot faces and they're done using this homemade cutter as detailed in Thomas's book. This is designed so that these inaccessible holes here can be reached by spinning the cutter around on the pilot shank and running the machine in reverse. The first two are easily done at the drill press and then it's over to the lathe to do the reverse ones. Here I'm just holding the casting by hand and the angle plate is there to apply pressure using the carriage hand wheel and to keep everything square. Okay, having a look at the work so far and I think we have acceptable progress. All the sides are machined square and two dimension. We have the mounting holes in the base. Those watching closely will have noticed that the casting moved on the angle plate as those holes were drilled. Uh, that setup was clearly not suitable for this operation which makes total sense. The downward forces are quite high when drilling and some jacks were required at an absolute minimum there. I have checked the hole spacing and I have been very lucky to get away with that. We have the holes drilled for the tailstock clamping cotters which go in here. The two oil holes are drilled into the spindle bore and the tapped hole that will be used to clamp those cotters for machining is also complete. Additionally, we have the hole for the spindle clamp on the side here, which will be machined with the main bore. And we have the spot faces on the mounting holes. Next time we will mount this on the lathe and cut the register for a mounting bracket. Uh, line bore the spindle housing to dimension and similarly bore the hole for the tailstock bar here.
That is just about enough for part one. Uh, please do leave any thoughts in the comments. If you want to see more like this, please subscribe. And hopefully I'll see you again. Cheerio.